Welcome to Take the Lead Radio with Dr. Diane Hamilton, where she interviews some of the most successful leaders, entrepreneurs, authors, speakers, and other individuals who will inspire you to take the lead in your career and personal life. And now, here is Dr. Diane Hamilton. I am here with Vernice Flygirl Armour, who propelled herself from beat cop to combat pilot in a record-breaking three years and became America's first African-American female combat pilot. I'm sure you've seen her on Oprah and everywhere else. She's inspired countless organizations and individuals to make gutsy moves and create breakthrough results. It's so nice to have you here, Vernice. It is awesome to be here with you, Dr. D. Is, is it okay if I call you that? I, 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 mean, I didn't even ask permission. Uh, you Marines can call don't do me, that. Diane. You can call me anything you want. I answer to just about anything. But, <laughs> awesome. but uh, it's so nice to have you on the show. And I watched your talks. I've watched you on The View. I've watched a lot of stuff you've done. And I loved your confidence on The View. I mean, it's just like, you're just so cool. <laughs> you, you got all these women uh, staring at you. With uh, You're right on the big screen and no problem. So I, I think I want to get uh, start the show with just a little background on you because I talked yeah. about, you know, a little bit in your bio. But I think if people haven't seen you yet, I would like to have them know more about you. So how did you get to be Fly Girl? So that's a great question. And uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, my call sign was absolutely not fly girl. So this is not the most politically correct story in the world, uh -huh. but all the pilots get call signs. And at the call sign naming ceremony, my commanding officer had written out this whole poem. And the very last part of it said, with all you have in that trunk, we will simply call you junk. Oh, so, wow. my call sign was junk for junk in the trunk. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, you know, they never do that. Oh, God. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. So, how did I get Fly Girl? So, I'm out, and I'm speaking, and I was actually doing a STEM event, Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, um, with Mae Jemison and Lisa Nichols, oh, right? Wow. From Lieutenant Uhura yeah. off of Star Trek. Oh my God, she is amazing. Uh, oh, and, well, both of them. I mean, Mae Jemison. Yes. Oh, wow. And some other powerhouse uh -huh. women. Like, there were mm -hmm. mathematicians, there were astrophysicists. Like, when Mae Jemison puts together an event based around science, it's, huh, this is funny, out of this world. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> Are you a Trekkie for, oh, for the Uhura thing? I am. A I mean, a I can totally speak Klingon. Oh, well, okay, no, not Trekkie. really. No, no, no. <laughs> but I do love a good Star Trek episode. I do too. So we are doing this event. It was at a National Guard unit um, right there at Midway Airport in Chicago. And of course, you know, if I'm in a National Guard unit, I walk around because I'm going to go talk to the guys in the flight equipment area right just to say hi how you doing check stuff out i'm just social like that and i saw these patches that um were uh that had the wings on aviator wings and then the word fly girl under it and i was like oh my god that's <laughs> awesome can uh -huh. i have one of those he was like yeah man take it it's yours so i started wearing it uh -huh. and then people started calling me fly girl uh -huh. And when I was going through my branding, and I was like, wait a minute, everybody calls me brand, uh, Fly Girl. They refer to me as Fly Girl. That should totally be in my branding. <laughs> so it became Bernice Fly Girl Armor. Oh, well, it, that it, was it. that's great, though. I've, I've seen a lot of your pictures, and you, you, you know, it's, it's great to see that you really embrace that. And as you've been on so many shows and all that we're going to go into, but what, what led to you even wanting to do this as a kid? I mean, you didn't grow up saying, hey, I want to be a combat pilot. I, no. So what do you think, no, what was I your didn't. childhood like and what, what led to this? So I was born in Chicago and I, at the age of four, I, I knew I wanted a horse and I always said I wanted to be a cop that rode a horse downtown. The Mountain Patrol. Uh -huh. and, cool. and my parents got divorced when I was three. Mm. Um, my mom got remarried. And my dad that I grew up with, um, he got me a horse when I was six. Wow. And so I was like, yes, I am halfway there. Right? <laughs> I mean, I knew I needed a horse. Uh -huh. So a um, nice gift. It, it was, oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. So then um, fast forward. I made it through high school. I was a band geek, played trombone and all that stuff. Uh, I'm at school. Um, I was going to, 
I was majoring in animal science, emphasis in horse science, actually, um, but decided, you know, I'd train and breed later. Uh, but I did want to be a police officer. That was still my dream. I filled out the civil servants exam a couple of years after that. Um, I ended up getting into the police academy. But along that journey, being in college, I ended up, I didn't have any money to go to school with. I saw a flyer on the wall that said, free trip to Mardi Gras. I was like, what? That is for me? Sign me up. Uh-huh. But Diane, you know, there's always a catch, they right? Always Not, they, they always say nothing's free. Uh-huh. So I had to join the women's ROTC auxiliary team. Uh-huh. So I joined the team. I was like, my dad was in the military. My father was in the military. My granddad was a Marine. I, I could do this. So I joined uh, because I also felt it could help me with the police department, right? Right. The prior military experience and the whole discipline and uniform and esprit de corps. So I enlisted in the army, came back, um, decided to do ROTC at my university. Uh, and during that time, during ROTC, I saw a black woman in a flight suit. Now, mind you, I was 19, 20 years old, right? Mm-hmm. Black woman in a flight suit, mind blown, poof. And from that moment on, I wanted to be a combat pilot. I, I wanted to fly. Um, I ended up getting accepted to the police department, withdrew from school, did a couple of years, finished up part time, ended up going into the Marine Corps. After four years of trying to get in, women could only apply once a year. The first year, they didn't accept me. The second year, they didn't accept me. The third year, it was a technicality. They didn't accept me. On the Now, mind you, the attrition rate is over 80% after the first year wow. of people who don't get in. They never apply again. So year four, they're looking at me like, who the hell is this chick? She's a, <laughs> she's a freaking anomaly, right? <laughs> so... Um, and there was some political stuff. It was right after Dakowitz and women being allowed to fly in the Marine Corps. Right. And I would have been the first. So there's probably some stuff all around that. And I ended up being the first black female pilot in the Marine Corps. And then after going to Iraq, the first black female combat pilot in all of the armed services. So um, wow. interesting journey all the way around. Yeah, And it totally surprised. Who knew? But um that's the story. That's a quite a story. And, you know, it, we had talked a little before the air that, that I do some work in perception. And you were talking about your mind was blown when you saw an African female, American female in uh, a yes. flight suit, right? Yes. So yes. why would why would that be such a mind blowing thing? I mean, did you never consider that women could That's reach so that level or that? Uh, just tell me. So perception can also be very insidious. And since you have a book coming out, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh-huh. Don't worry, pay me later, pay okay, me later. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. But um, since the age, because my parents got divorced when I was three, mm-hmm. my brother and I started flying on the plane very early as unaccompanied minors to go visit my dad during the summer, right? Mm-hmm. So I never saw black people as pilots on uh-huh. the plane. You always saw the white. And now, again, this is very subconscious, right? Unconscious stuff. Right. You're getting on. I just never saw any black crew. So when my when I went to ROTC leadership advance camp, my battle buddy, young white female, was actually on an aviation contract. She was going to be a pilot. I wanted nothing to do with aviation. I, I wanted. I mean, I I wanted to be a cop. So I wanted to do field artillery, sniper platoon, Delta Force, special forces. You know, anything where I could shoot a gun uh-huh. or blow something up. All right. And, oh, by the way, everything that women could not do because of the combat exclusion laws at the time. Uh-huh. So, fast forward. No, so we're, it's, it's career day. We walk around around 1230. She's so like, Armor, can we please go to the aviation tent now? We have looked at everything in this field. I'm like, all right, fine. Black people don't even fly. <laughs> and then, which is so not true, uh-huh, right? Right. Bessie Coleman, Tuskegee Airmen, Willa Brown. The legacy is long and large. And it is absolutely about access and exposure. You know, at the time of this recording, um, Black Lives Matter movement is going on. George Floyd, um, you know, Mr. Brooks, uh, Breonna Taylor. Like, right. there's a whole movement around access and exposure of just Black Lives Mattering the same as other lives right right so i got distracted wait a minute wait a minute <laughs> help me diane wait well so you're looking at these women and this was such an issue oh right 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 so my battle buddy mm-hmm. young white female so i say the whole little drop you know black people don't fly which 
I'm yeah. a, I'm gonna be honest. I'm not. I know I'm. My side hustle is being a comedian, and I make make my little one liners. But I was really being serious in that moment. Like black people don't fly, and it was not the truth. Again, access and exposure. We go across the field. We walk into the tent. Little dim inside. Cami netting everywhere. I look towards the back. Takes a second for my eyes to adjust to the dimness, and boom, black chick in a flight suit. I'm like, what? <laughs> That is cool. Why didn't I think of that? My battle buddy's like, I told you. Oh, that's awesome. So I had never envisioned myself yeah. as that pilot. Because all I had, I'd never, never seen anyone like me. Now, does that mean I, I shouldn't have thought about it or why couldn't it have been? That's so, it's, yeah, great question. But that's just how it was. I mean, right, Obama, when he was running for president, I remember in the very beginning, I was like, oh, that's awesome. E for effort. Ain't going to ever happen, but E for effort. Yeah, yeah. And boom, there it is, you know, and it happened. Yeah. Right. So that's what happened. And it planted the seed, and here I am talking to you. But, you know, it's such a... um... It's such an interesting part of the research I did with curiosity of what assumptions we make. And and, and, mm-hmm. and there's the things that hold us back from being curious are fear, assumptions, right. technology and environment. And a lot right. of it is, you know, they kind of overlap to some extent. So you're, you have people in your you know, around you that might never have, you know, said you could do this or that it was right. even a possibility. So, I, I mean, what? What would you, t- you, you, do you have children? I don't know if I know. I do. do, I have one little, her name is Fly Baby. I'm Fly Girl, she's Fly Baby. <laughs> well, and you, she's four and a half. You're Fly Baby, do you teach her uh, of potential or do you, you know, how do you, what do you do to open up the world for her? So she travels with me and we go pl- places together. And um, I mean, I'm just so excited about everything that she gets to discover and see with me, which most four, five, six, seven, ten year olds, you know, as she grows up, will probably never have the opportunity to do. Like, uh, the I had the opportunity to go to the last space shuttle launch, right? And my partner's son, who was 13 at the time, got to be there and see the last time aircraft left American soil going into space until just recently, a month ago, when we sent uh, two guys up again. And one of my best friends is an astronaut, and um, he's been selected to go up. So taking her to things like that, showing her that everything is available and more. My parents did that, too. I I mean, I, they tell me, you can do anything. Everything is possible. I remember sitting down recording my grandfather, who was in World War II. He was a Mumford Point Marine. What's a Mumford Point Marine? The first blacks to be a part of the Marine Corps. They actually went to a segregated boot camp because they could not go to boot camp with their white counterparts, right? And I kept saying you know i gotta document this i gotta record him i gotta record him he's living history and i remember at one point uh he's telling me about the war and the jobs he's like we could never be a pilot like uh, you know we were in the boardroom or we were janitors or we were cooks and i never i never would have imagined that my granddaughter would be an officer wow. in the marine corps yeah that, that's... And, he, and he said you could do anything like i have I can feel my eyes watering up right now because it's so trite. It's so, so cliche. Yeah. You can do anything. <laughs> and here my grandfather was 90 something years old, looking at me from almost a century old, telling me I never would have imagined. And God, you can do anything. Right. And it's so true. So true. So that's what I'm trying to do for my kid. Show her the world. So Do you, I have time to share a 60 second story? Oh, you have plenty of time. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> because this ties to the question you just asked me, like, okay. how am I showing her everything is possible? Yeah, yeah. And what I have discovered is I have to be more influential than the outside programming. So she's four and a half right now, but about six, seven months ago, maybe, maybe nine months ago, um, she was doing something. She was in the bathtub and she did something. It was amazing. Of course, it's my kid. It's going to be amazing. I was like, oh, my God. Hey, Noah, you are so strong. And she was like, mommy, no, I am not strong. I was like, what? I'm the, I'm the chick that talks about gutsy and bold leadership mm-hmm. and engagement. Like, and, you know, and uh-huh. I'm like, how is my kid telling me she's not strong? I was like, baby, yes, you are. She was like, no, mommy. I don't, I don't want to be strong. I just want to be a girl. Hmm. Diane, 
the air could have sucked all the way out of my body and my blood and my heart could have stopped in that moment. I was like, what? I was like, baby, I'm strong. I'm a girl. You, I is a strong. I said, Manny, she's a girl. Grammy's strong. And I said, okay, are you, are you smart? She said, no. I said, are you intelligent? She said, no. I said, are you pretty? She said, yes. I said, are you um, cute? She said, yes. I said, are you scared? She said, yes. I said, are you shy? She said, yes. And in that moment, what I realized is that even though this kid is only four years old, whether it's TV or the cartoons or the iPad, you know, all these outside influences. Environment, right. And absolutely. And is there somebody telling her she's not strong? No. But she's looking at what is portrayed as girls being saved. Girls like pink and glitter. Girls do this. Girls do that. Girls don't have short hair. Right? I mean. Right, right. Wow. So in that moment, I made that. And she might have been three and a half, actually. In that moment, I made the decision that even though I say these things, I got to say them a lot. I have to show her a lot Uh because it's not really what I say. It's what I show her. It goes back to your perception. Oh, my God. I need to read your book. (laughs) Yes. Like, seriously, it's deep. I think I will give it to you as soon as we get off the show. Uh, Yes. yes, Nice. Yes. And we'll have fun chatting about that. And I love that you are already opening up the world to her because what she's talk about zero to breakthrough. Uh, She's so young and you're doing so much with her. That's the name of your first book. Uh, Yeah. And you help people to just if they want to, you know, succeed and you change their mindset. So you're working on your daughter and I love that you do that. So I want to get talk about the book for a minute because that was uh, what Penguin and you, you've had yes. success with that quite a bit. And th- is yes. that when you still talk to groups, is that your main focus is zero through ba- zero to b- breakthrough or uh, are you on a new type of topic since then? So it's really interesting. Uh, first, I want to address when you say I change people's mindsets. So you and I both know I can't change anybody's mind. I can't make anybody do anything. Um, and one of my friends said, Bernice, because I said, what, what do I do? What's the magic I create? And my friend said, Bernice, it's like, it doesn't matter. We could be going through the line at the grocery store or you could be in the car service and talking to the driver. But when people leave your presence, they are confronted with the possibility that there's more. There's yeah. more to their life. There's more to what they could do. There's more to, if, if they want more, they have it. So zero to breakthrough, yes, engagement, uh, before I could release missiles, the ground controller would say, you have permission to engage, cleared hot. Well, here at home, there are no ground controllers in life. You are your ground controller. If you don't give yourself permission, who will? Right. That was the foundation. Mm-hmm. Then um, I came to realize like what some of my magic was and how I created the breakthroughs, which was almost like the prequel, right? Of the, the movie before the, the movie. Yeah. Uh, and in order to engage in some of those moments, it took guts, you know, all the courage, whatever people want to call it. And I ended up calling that the gutsy move. In your gut, you know it's right. It takes guts to do it, but you got to take action, right? It's, right? it's not a gutsy thought. It's a gutsy move. And that's where gutsy leadership uh, was born for me. And that was around 20, 2011, 2012. And uh, my next book that I am uh, working on, this is the working title, is The Gutsy Move. And I thought about doing, you know, The Gutsy Leader or Gutsy Leadership but it's really beyond just executives in the corporation. It's almost like how Brene Brown, you know, daring greatly. I mean, right. it was everywhere, whether it was a, a mom or mm-hmm. work or, or whatever. Yeah, she's great. So, yeah, yeah. So I really wanted it to be a book for everyone because everyone can make that gutsy move in their life to achieve whatever they want. Well, you have get gutsy, live gutsy. I like that. I'm looking at all your trademark <laughs> stuff. One mission, one yes. goal, one team. You've got quite a few different trademarks. I, I think that I, I love the gutsy thing because I, I, I love the whole Nike just do it mentality for one mm-hmm. thing. And I don't think a lot of people 
push themselves enough. They just no. They the just fear. kind of exist instead of live. A lot of fear. Yeah. They're All like, my yes. 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 And, yes. <laughs> and the fear was what I expected when I researched curiosity. I assumed everybody, you know, was going to say fear. And fear does hold people back. But what surprised me were some of the other things that held people back. I mean, just the, the, like we talked about before, the assumptions, the things that we tell ourselves. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to be interested in that. It's going to be too hard. Or, I've never seen mm -hmm. an African-American female mm -hmm. do that. Or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is that you, you put in your head. Yeah. But you've obviously got a lot of support. So your environment, which a lot of people have uh, their environment, don't they don't have grandfathers or people like what you talked about from your family all being in military and different things as support systems. And it can be really hard for people to, to see. They don't know what they don't know because they haven't been exposed to it. So I love that you go around and talk about these things of getting people aware of their, even if it's in the grocery store line or whatever you said, because people, right. people don't really put themselves out there. So how, how do you get people to, I mean, you are so enthusiastic and you have this life to you that you probably were just an adorable child that did that all the time. I, I listen to what I envision. Um, do you, um, do you, can you get people to have that enthusiasm? Do they need that enthusiasm? So it's, it's not about enthusiasm. Like I'm actually, I have a friend right now and it's, uh, and we talk about this. I'm like, dude, you, there are so many assumptions you're working off of here. Oh my God. Like, why didn't you call me? Oh, I just thought you're probably busy or either. Or I just knew you like, but no, you didn't know. You just assumed she's like, Oh, yeah, well, yeah, you're right. Like on different things, right? It's, it's like all these assumptions that are keeping, well, oh, they're probably, they're probably not open right now. Or, oh, they're probably this or that. And, and so I said, look, if you got to make up a story because you don't know, why not pick the best case scenario instead of the worst? Right, right. And I go off that. Of that one. Uh -huh. And let's drive towards that. If uh -huh. we got to make something up, right? And when I ask people questions and I dig because, I love how curiosity is a part of your work, your body of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Because I love telling people, like, I'm just asking you questions because honestly, I have an intense curiosity, an intense curiosity to understand how you came to that answer or how you came to that decision or how you came to that process versus why'd you do that? <laughs> I use those words, right? Because people feel attacked. Uh -huh. Even uh -huh. if I say, oh, wow, why'd you do that? Uh -huh. It still feels, it feels, I can say it in the sweetest way ever. And somebody's still going to feel attacked. Mm -hmm. But that why did you, mm -hmm. you know, people feel questioned. Right. So I was like, man, I got an intense curiosity. I love to know how you came to that conclusion. And it's totally different. Yeah, so I great. go through life like that. Mm -hmm. But, you like, know, you're softening, the, you know, it, I think a lot of people feel attacked sometimes when they think yes. that uh, you're questioning that what they've yes. done or what, you know, and I was just looking at some research of men versus women on that. And after seminars in, in Cambridge, there's a bunch of different studies out there, but there was, uh, they found that women are less likely to ask questions because they don't want to point out like any kind of Offend. issues or offend yeah. the speaker. Yeah. But the men, the first thing they want to ask is so because they notice something wrong with what the speaker said and they have no problem right. pointing it out. But do you think as women, we, we tend to want to just not offend and be careful too much and avoid and questioning, which puts us into status quo? I mean, it permeates so many things. If we're going to do a gross generalization on women, you know, and yeah, let's say the pay here. gap and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Well, it, I mean, research and studies show that a guy negotiates for a higher salary. A woman is just like, oh, my God, thanks for the job. A guy asks for the pay raise and the woman's like, oh, my God, I'm just glad to be here. Uh -huh. You know, the guy gets the promotion. She's like, oh, my God, they're going to see how hard I'm working. <laughs> and when the post comes out and it's like, hey, we're going to promote somebody and it's 10 prerequisites and the woman's like oh my god I only got 9.5 I'm not qualified right. the guy's like I got half a one I'm going for it <laughs> so <laughs> that's exactly it that is so funny. there are some systemic things uh -huh. right. with how women it seems are raised like if I walk into a classroom and that side of the the room is painted blue and has all the boy toys and the other side is painted pink and has all the girl toys I mean, what the hell? I mean, what are we doing from the very beginning? Yeah. So no wonder there's this huge difference and there's a pay gap because women never ask for the money and never ask for the raise and guys do. So even if it's diff um, separate systemically in the system, it's even more so just because of how we are behaving, right? Yeah. And it's all driven by 
unconscious and assumptive thoughts that we don't even question and it's deep well you obviously question you know a lot of things and i love that i mean you were on weren't you on a motorcycle squad and you play football yes. and you're, you're yes you're beat cop my dad my uh, dad played for the colts when they were back in baltimore oh, really? and i always wanted to play football and he he was a coach for a pop warner team the mighty Steelers. you know i never forget that pop warner and I did. I wanted to play, but he didn't let me place it. But he said I could be a cheerleader. That uh, lasted for all of ten minutes of one game, and I threw those pom poms <laughs> down. And the, so, the, well, I'm sure you probably were stronger and harder working than any of the other players on the team. I could imagine. Well, you know, I think you know your success. You took all this. As I said, you started as a beat cop. You ended up doing all these things. How hard was it, first of all, to get through boot camp and everything else that you had to go through? I mean, the, I mean, we're talking you're not just in, you know, the uh, desk job. I mean, you're a combat pilot. You you know, I just can't even imagine what it's like going through that training because my nephew just went through uh, for the Air Force and he said it was the worst and the best thing he's gone through. Do you agree with that? I mean, how hard was it? So basic training was tough. That's Army. Yeah. And Officer Canada candidate school for the Marine Corps was grueling. Right. I mean, when I graduated from basic training with the Army, it was four months. I was still in the turtle group. Like, I was still a slow runner. Um, I, was, I, mean, I was in okay shape, not the best shape in the world. When I graduated from officer candidate school, when I first got there, I was running three miles in 31 minutes and 32 seconds. I'll never forget that. Wow. And when I graduated, I had just, I my fastest run was 21 minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, and I had lost mm. 10 pounds. I was lean. I mean, mm. my body wanted to run instead of walk anywhere I went. And I was in the best. Sh I mean, I could climb all the cargo nets, go through the mud, carry the log. Like, you are a machine when yeah. you leave that place, right? So was it hard? Heck yeah, it was hard. <laughs> you know, and I think it's, it's hard for anybody that yeah. goes through something like that. And it was hard for most of, like, there are some athletes, right, that could probably go to the Olympics, you know, when they first get to Oscar Candidate School. And physically, it might not be as demanding for them. Yeah. But for the average person, um, you're definitely not average the day you become a Marine Corps officer. I can't even imagine. You know, I was listening to something that Demi Moore was saying about um, – the G.I. Jane, GI Jane training she went through. And she said no matter how oh, hard yeah. she worked, I don't even think she could do more than two pull-ups even when she was done with all that. Were you Are you able to do the pull-ups or how hard was that? So I was training at one point and my goal was to do 20 dead arm hang pull-ups and I got up to 16. Oh, that's amazing. So, I can't even move I, an inch. Not, not even a half an inch, I don't think. <laughs> to pull yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, it's just something hard. yes you you can uh -huh. you just have to work up to it I haven't just yet. like yes <laughs> i could never fly an attack helicopter the first day i went out and did that attack helicopter there was no way i could have right. flown it That's right. i had to learn nobody pops out the womb knowing how to do any of this crap we can't even go to the bathroom by ourselves or eat by ourselves right mm -hmm. so right. everything is learned and it's it's hard until it's not hard anymore so that's a lot different, though, being in a, a, a combat pilot as compared to a beat cop. I mean, do, what what is it like when you're up there? I mean, do you, the first time you go up, I mean, do they do all the things where they try to make you throw up and spin you around and do all that to get you over? <laughs> or is that just amazing? Oh, God. Yeah, I was determined I wasn't going to throw up, right? Each flight, uh -huh. each beginning flight is about an hour and a half. And I had a really cool instructor, so he was showing me some extra stuff. And, yes, we did all the aerobatics and... He's like, oh, well, let's take the long way back. And I'm like, no, I'm just trying to hold it together. Because I was like, yes, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. But I could feel something coming on. Yeah. Uh, we were maybe eight, five to eight minutes from landing. And um, I ended up taking off my glove. And there's probably more information than you guys need to know. <laughs> but if it had been an hour and a half flight, I would have made it. But the two hours got me. So, they yeah, don't let you it happens. Until you, they, you, they break you probably on that, huh? Oh. <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, I was listening to you, you, when you give your talks, you give some great stories uh, that really, I mean, the audience is just following along and, you know, it's very moving to watch what you went through and some of the, the stories. And you've been on Oprah talking about some of the stuff you did. What was it like when you got to yeah. go on Oprah? Was that something that they came after oh. you? Did you go, 
How did that work? No, they came after me. They came after me, and the public relations officer said, hey, we got a phone call for you. And this was during combat operations, right? So we weren't allowed to talk on the phone. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't spoken to my mom and dad for a, about a month, I think, at the time. And um, I had a satellite phone, and, and it was amazing. And as a little kid, you know, the reason I wanted to be a cop, well, yeah, I'm out of patrol. But then as I got a little older and older and older, I wanted to do something to help my community. And, you know, of course, being interested in being a police officer, I knew that would help my community. And uh, then after being a, a cop, you know, on my city, on my beat, I wanted to do something bigger and I asked to do something bigger. Then I ended up going into the Marine Corps. And who knew that when I came out on the other side, people would be asking me to reach out to organizations and help, right? Right. So it's almost like every step had led me to doing and being what I am right now. But um, the challenges and obstacles along the way absolutely prepared me for this very moment talking to you right now and to go on to what I'm meant to do. Every obstacle is just preparing me for my next mission. Well, okay, so that now your next mission, you, you started a company um, once you you got out and you had, what, six figures in your first 12 months of your business? So tell me a little bit yeah. about that success. So what, what kind of company and, what, you know, it was training, consulting, right? That, that And you still do, correct? Yes, yes, that is still my company, even though I have also started a construction company. Because oh. uh, I, I, I want to be a total like Elon Muscat or something, right? <laughs> Serial entrepreneur. Uh -huh. I'm going to do something. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but yes, I started my company. And when I came back, I actually went to a couple schools and I spoke and I was like, wow, this would be really cool. I love speaking. This will be my give back, my way to give back to my community. And after coming back from Iraq, people were actually reaching out to me. And I'm like, wow, well, this is cool, right? So right. It's, again, those previous things had set me up for exactly what I wanted to do. Who knew? So fast forward, I'm speaking, I'm traveling, and I, I, my cousin talked me into writing a book actually while I was deployed in Iraq. When I first graduated from flight school, he asked me to write a book and I was like, Cousin, I haven't even I haven't even done anything yet. It's just a title. Let me do something. Two deployments later, two o'clock in the morning, talking to him on a sat phone on the border of Syria. I'm like, I'm ready. <laughs> and that's when uh, Zero to Breakthrough was born. And uh, the gutsy move now. And again, at the time of this recording, Black Lives Matter movement. And sitting on my deck, COVID hits. All my keynotes are canceled. Oh, I'm like, crap, what am I going to do? I beat myself up for a little bit, for a couple of days. Then I'm like, wait a minute. I used to get excited when people were fired. Because I was like, oh, this is just an opportunity. Now you get to do what you really want to do. It's like, I got to take my own medicine. I get to create whatever I want. So what do I want to create? Then Black Lives Matter happens. Right. George, The death of George Floyd. Everybody's at home, so they have no options but to like really just see it and our whole country is going through stuff and here I am sitting on my desk saying what am I gonna do what should I do what can I do with my platform I had never spoken about anything political you know it's no Republican or Democrat or anything like that from the platform bold gutsy leadership engagement doesn't matter what side you're on and in this moment it's like how do I how do I navigate this and I, I knew immediately this is not a political conversation. Right. This is a, this is being proactive. This is about humanity. This is, I mean, like we're talking about lives on the line and you know, yes, you have the people that say, well, all lives matter. And yes, all lives do matter. And that's what we're saying. Black lives matter as much as anybody else's life. Right. Right. And if I were to say it in another way, when I am in a breast cancer march, there's nobody there protesting saying, but all cancer matters. Right. What about lung cancer? What about pancreatic cancer? Uh -huh. We're all there for breast cancer. We're not saying none of it else, none of the other stuff matters. Right. 
So that and I, I, that's the part I think people don't get about the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, as a black gay woman that all three categories that get discriminated against, yeah. whether I was just black or only a woman or only gay, right, right, right? right. and a former cop keeping peace on the streets with the protests wow, and the you, riots, yeah, got, former you. soldier, National Guard, keeping peace on the streets with the riots, and a diversity officer for headquarters of the Marine Corps on a committee to implement diversity policy in all the services. It's like, holy crap, if I have all these dots and can't connect the dots, what luck does anybody else have that doesn't have any dots or maybe just one or two. So I knew I had to use my voice right. in this moment to be a voice for the folks who felt voiceless and giving tangible things to do. Like I learned, I wrote an op-ed that ended up being published in a couple papers and it was about the new conversation where the old conversation is the one my dad had with me where he said, Bernice, uh, he's teaching me how to drive and he tells me to pull over. And then he looks at me and he says, what do you do if you get pulled over by the police? I said, make my hands visible. He goes, how? Yes, put them at the 10 and 2. He said, that's right. And I said, but dad, what if I didn't do anything? He said, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Wow. You know, it's something that I think so many people, if they're not African-American, don't think anything about at all. And I, I think that you're in such a visible um you know, the press could, I imagine, comes to you for uh, interviews quite often because of, like you said, you, you've experienced all these different things now. Right. We, as, but as they don't. Guy, they, they don't yet. But I'm trying to get the well, exposure out there <laughs> yeah. to be that voice. Yeah. Well, maybe this is going to, yes. you know, well, help. Yeah, I will definitely do my part to make sure everybody knows that you want this because I think that, I think that they need somebody like you because you're just so... Um, you, you have, like you said, every single aspect of what we're talking about in society right now. And you've experienced all of these different things. Now, I, I don't know if I hear it as much from the um, African-American women as I do from the men of being stopped, of being harassed as much. Do you think that the women uh, got it as much? Or did you, do you think your father would say the same thing to his son as he would to his daughter? You know, no, it's different. Now, I can be sitting in my car, or no, no, I could be walking down the street and I still hear doors click lock. Or I step on an elevator and a woman will scoot a little further away and hold her purse on the other side. Yeah, th th I mean, that's just, wow. yeah. I mean, I was 11 years old and I was there with my stepsister. She was 20 something. We went into Radio Shack, it was Christmas time. And the uh, the attendant came over, the or the service rep, the whatever you want to call it, came over and said, hey, do you mind taking your coats off? Now, it's like 30-something degrees outside. We just walked into the store. And the guy, and I started to take my coat off. And my sister was like, whoa, stop. What are you doing? Don't take your coat off. I was like, oh, okay. And then I look around the store. Everybody else has their coat on. And she's like, why do you want us to take our coat off? He's like, well, it's just the store policy. You have, a, you have on a big coat. We're, we're going we're gonna to need you to take your coat off or you're going to have to leave. He's like, but why do you want us to take our coats off? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody else in here has their coat on. He's like, ma'am, I'm just going to have to ask you to leave. And in that moment, I got that, oh, wait a minute. He's asking us because we're the only black people in here, and he doesn't want us to shoplift and put stuff in our coat. Wow. Yeah, I'm 11 years old. Wow. Which city was this? So, uh, that was, uh, where was that? Memphis. That was Memphis at the time, and I've lived in quite a few cities, but I mean, uh -huh. Diane, honestly, that stuff just happens. I mean, yeah. you just, and you just unfortunately, you get always, used yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. But that's what this movement is all about. I, I mean, when I got pulled over on my motorcycle and because the police officer said, well, you look like a nervous driver. Or I got pulled over two days in a row driving down the interstate. And this is after I was a police officer. And I'm asking, OK, what was I doing, officer? And he's like, well, just look like your tent was a little dark. I'm like, are you kidding? And I had oh, my cruise wow. control set at 70 miles an hour. Because I'd just been pulled over the day before in my uniform. I was like, what, what, what is going on? So it doesn't matter who you are. And, you know, we make jokes like driving while black and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But there really is something going on with the DNA, the very fabric of our nation. And, and even where policing comes from, right? As a cop, I knew I was one of the good guys. 
I'm out there. I am going to protect our people. I'm going to protect my block. I go to the tough neighborhoods because I know I'm going to find people with warrants and drugs and, you know, suspended licenses. So I'm going to the tough neighborhood. Diane, where was the tough neighborhood? The black neighborhood. That's right. You can say it. It was a black neighborhood. So here I am, a um, brand new cop, over policing my own brothers and sisters because I'm here to quote unquote crack down on crime. Pulling people over at a corner where I could just sit and watch people for not using the turn signal because that's going to give me an excuse to pull them over, find a suspended license, do a search on the car, find some drugs, and now I got an arrest. Wow, really? I'm not, I wasn't doing that in the white neighborhood. Yeah. I wasn't doing that. So it's, it was like this thing about how police, how we are bred and led. It's not, it's not that we're bad people. There are just some, and, and cops stick together. There's a code. You yeah, don't yeah. quote unquote rat each other out, right? So with this whole police reform thing, and why I'm even talking about this, Diane, is because it ties back into the gutsy leadership piece, yeah, no, right? I'm interested. I think this is fascinating. Like, uh -huh. Do we have the guts to, one, number one, acknowledge we have some injustices going on? Right. And number two, do we have the guts to do something? Right now, on the 30th of June, we are fighting to get an anti-lynching bill through the Senate. We know it's not okay. Why are we having to fight for something like that? Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, so, but your perspective, I'm curious if from the police officer's angle, since you have that yes. angle as well. Yes. I'm sure people are asking you, what do you think about, you know, putting you know pressure on somebody's neck like that where they can't breathe or, you know, does that, did you see people doing these kinds of things? Did you, or this? Absolutely, I was taught the chokehold. You were. And I was, that was taught part the of the training. Yes. And just a couple of days ago, I looked it up and in Nashville, Tennessee, it was still legal to do the chokehold. Now, it's been a couple of days, right? So they might have changed their policy right. in this moment. Uh -huh. But yes, I was absolutely taught the chokehold, carotid, put the, put your elbow right here. You hold them until they pass out because it blocks off the blood from so, going oh, to the brain. Want you to have absolutely. Pass out. Yeah. Huh. Well, that's what the chokehold is for. Well, I thought it was just to hold them down. I didn't realize they were trying to actually make them pass out. So they, they... No, it's to make somebody pass out, to make them go to sleep so they're not resisting anymore. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. Right. And so right. do you think that that needs to be changed then, the training? Do you think that they, they don't? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So, absolutely. So how do we get this without, how do you get people to recognize that, of course, the police have been taught a certain thing, that they're not the bad guy. This, these guys are the bad guys, possibly, but not, maybe so, you know, not other police. How, I mean, people okay. don't like to lump so everybody deep. together, you know? Right, right. So it's a little deeper than just how do we adjust the training? Mm -hmm. Because it's a culture. Again, right. it goes back to the culture, how, again, uh, you know, how we're bred and led. So if you understand the origins of policing, they were overseers of slaves on plantations. Then when the slaves were freed, they were the vigilantes who were who arrested black people, um, who were freed slaves for doing even the smallest of crimes because all the labor was gone hmm. from the slavery, right? Now right. they arrested people. So now you got the chain gang. And uh -huh. now we have our labor again. And it went from enforcing the Jim Crow laws, right? All the colored laws, back of the bus, don't drink out the white water fountain. I mean, we see it in all the movies from the 50s right. and 60s and, you know, Selma and all of that stuff, how, right. you know, blacks were turning the water hose yeah. and the dogs mm -hmm. and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so the police of that time, and then if you look at some of the policing history on some of the departments, it'll say, we became a more professional department. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Yeah, well, how do you how do you become more professional? Uh -huh. Well, they went from being like just vigilante Jim Crow into really trying to be safe for the the community. But being safe for the community also meant protecting whites from blacks. So now Dr. King is assassinated. We have six days of violent rioting, and people are talking about oh the looting, the rioting. I don't I don't agree with the violence after six days of rioting the Civil Rights Act was finally passed. In six days, they passed that Civil Rights Act because of what was happening. Kaepernick protesting quietly, that didn't get any attention, that didn't change. Now, I'm not advocating violence. I'm just saying different things shift, right? right. So now fast forward to policing today, 
Diane, we're not that far removed from, I mean, it's 50 years since Dr. King's assassination. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, you still have people on the department who've been on the department for 42 years. So they're still I mean, it's, in the way right? It yeah, yeah. That's what I'm, right. Mm -hmm. So we are, really have to look at the culture and the philosophy. Like when that officer was kneeling on George Floyd's neck and everybody was yelling at him, it incensed him even more to stay there because it's like, I'm the police. You don't tell me what to do. Stand back. Get back. And they all banded together. Not one once and the rookie cop, there were two rookie cops. They'd only been on the street for what, three, four, five days? Okay. They didn't know any better. They didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have known what to do in that moment. Right. I was actually in a moment like that. And I remember thinking, uh -huh. Well, he's a sergeant. He knows, he knows more than I do. Uh -huh. He trains rookies like me. I mean, I just need to watch to see what happens. I was in that moment. I could have been in an orange suit. Do you, so do you think you should have it's been? crazy. If you were one. well, it didn't. It didn't. Well, mm, you know what I mean. If, they, if that had happened, you know what I mean. That's a tough one. And yeah, if they've just been out for a few days and they don't even know what's going on, and they maybe just think that he's going to pass out or whatever it is that they've taught you. I mean, it's it's That's such exactly a right. hard. It's it, there's just a no good answers for any of this stuff. That's why I think you would be so interesting uh, to, to uh, be, be a voice for such an important topic because I, it, when we talk about perception there's so many ways I mean you're, you're looking at it from as a cop you're looking at it from you know all the different uh, you know female and black all the things you were saying and so I, I think that it's just going to be a really really uh, difficult year especially combined with COVID and everything else that's going on right uh, it's just crazy and now you you can't do a lot of your speaking and your training as you mentioned and as I can't you know we, but a lot of things we're having to do virtually so I imagine you could do a lot of this media you know yeah, virtually which would be great and I that's would right. love to see you do more right. of that so I, I hope that you get to be um, much more known for your because obviously you have a great um, insight from your experience and uh, I, I know we touched on a lot of your experience and the things that you've done and I wanted to also uh, congratulate you for your two honorary doctorates I'm curious what they're in one is a doctorate of laws and the other is a doctorate of letters letters so, yes what writing English oh for uh... <laughs> I've never heard it called a doctorate of letters. Right. That's I know, uh, right? Wait, that's interesting. Well, you know, I, I think that, it, you know, you've gotten a lot of recognition for so many great things that you've done. And I was really excited to have you uh, on the show today because you, you've just, you, you've always been an inspiration to me. And I know we've had a lot of uh, times that we've tried to get this together where we could get on and get you on the show. So I'm so glad you were able to make it today. But I, I want to make sure that everybody um, knows, of course, your book, Zero to Breakthrough. They could probably get everywhere, I'm sure, Amazon and everything else. Is there some yep. other kind of uh, site or anything else, social media, you'd like to share of how they could follow you or contact you? Well, there's number one, I have a resource if people would like to get their hands on it on how to make a gutsy move of their own. And, you know, before I jump to that, and as we wrap up that last conversation, mm -hmm. I just want to say, you know, our police are, it's its not about good or bad people. It's about behavior that needs to change, that needs to shift. Mm -hmm. And that's thats all this is about. Our right. mindset and our behavior, our, like you said, our assumptions, our unconscious biases, and bringing light to some of the inequalities and injustices that are there that we can absolutely remedy period in the story but we have to take it from protest to policy protesting isn't going to do anything if we don't vote and get policy in place period in the story that how can people make book. their protest to policy <laughs> I, I love that no the perception <laughs> of protest <laughs> And pop, no. <laughs> the three P's, yes. Co-authored co by <laughs> Dr. Diane, we may Dr. Have Fly to Girl. consider something like that. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Fly, Fly Girl. Girl, I think. Yeah, I why like don't you that. add that? It could be like I, I uh, was on Sister Dr. Jenna's show once. You could have multiple titles. I think it would be. Cool. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, yeah, man. Well, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Well, in the meantime, um, how can they follow you and find out more? So, number one. You can text GUTSY, G-U-T-S-Y, to 72,000. 
If you do that, you will get a three-part video series on how to overcome your challenges and obstacles, and you will get an action guide on how the steps, the process, walking you through how to make your gutsy moves. And share with your friends, your family, your, your colleagues at work, your leadership team, whatever. Uh, my gift to the folks that are listening to the sound of my voice. Oh, how you awesome. can get in touch with me real time. You know, Renice Flygirl Armor on Instagram. I love Insta, Twitter, and Facebook. And on LinkedIn, Renice Flygirl Armor. The only place it's different is Twitter because it was too long. So it's just at Renice Armor on Twitter. And of course, the website. Or email flygirl at com. I'm here. <laughs> yes, you are. And you are so much fun to talk to, Bernice. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really enjoyed this. Hey, me too. Me too. And uh, I just look forward to being a voice and helping folks navigate and, you know, maybe have a facilitated conversation through these unprecedented times. 